Welcome back to The Mining Pod. For our second holiday special, we're joined by Jason Less, CEO of Riot Blockchain. In this interview, we discuss competition among miners, building the world's largest Bitcoin mine during COVID, how to think about mining equities, working with ERCOT, deploying S19 XPs, and bear market mining strategies. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics, from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Jason, welcome to the Mining Pod. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you for having me, William. Awesome. You're coming to the home turf, too. Yeah, there we the, go. O- o- Orange County is like this unsuspecting Bitcoin mining capital. There's actually a lot of companies and people here. It is. Like, I actually lived here during COVID. So I moved out here two months before COVID happened. It was January 2020. And then saw like all the stuff that Blodgy was posting on Twitter at the time, like all these videos from China, like people just like getting locked in their apartments. Um, that was frightening. And then, you know, I hit California in March and I was stuck here working for Coindesk at the time, a crypto reporter. And I didn't know that there was any sort of like crypto people here at all. So I moved back to Denver, started working at Compass and yeah. found out that Riot's here, Elancium here, uh, Marathon's here, US Bitcoin I think is here. So yeah, I kind of rugged myself a little bit, but yeah. it's okay. We got to start off the show talking about FTX and Binance this morning. Just your quick hits. Um, Quick reactions to that. Be interested to get your thoughts on it. it so people people talk about this industry moving so fast, yeah. and I think this is an, a not only a great example of that, an extreme example of this. Like yeah. you look at the commentary over the past seventy two hours, forty eight hours, twenty four hours, to going from you know CZ and SBF yeah. threatening to dump each other's <laughs> coins on each other to we're best friends now, we're doing a deal. <laughs> it's, it's incredible how fast things move, and I also think it's. You know, another example of what this bear market can do yeah. to companies, despite Bitcoin having all this historical volatility and all the indicators out there that you need to be prepared for that. You know, still everyone has different views. That's what makes a market. Yeah. And we, we find these different companies find themselves in different stress mm-hmm. situations. So uh, hoping for a good resolution for the customers of the exchange more than anything. Yeah, well, while we're talking about it, we should also talk about like, the mining sector uh, and their struggle with debt the last month. We'll get into that in a second. But quick thought, just on relationships in the industry. Uh, from your viewpoint as a CEO, like how how do you work on these relationships and make them happen? Because like what you just said, like Sam and CZ were just like you know, tweeting at each other one night, mm-hmm. you know, f- dumping on each other the tokens, and the next day they're working on a deal. That always stands out to me as like the most dynamic part of the industry where everyone's like quick to be barbs on Twitter, but then the next day they're quick to make a handshake deal. Mm -hmm. Like, are you finding that to be a similar case in your viewpoint as a CEO in the company? Like, is that pretty common that people have like their, their, their castle walls up and then the next day they're ready to just like spin and trade a deal? So I, I think there's kind of two components to that. You know, yeah. the castle, there's there's the personal relationship side, that, yeah. you know, that everyone's, or there's a personal component that's always going to exist as a result of being a person. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we're all fiduciaries, right? Yeah. So you might have a, a viewpoint, you might, you know, it, it's impossible to completely remove personal, emotional connection from everything. So, yeah. you know, th- there might be... Um, different points of view and maybe those come out publicly but at the end of the day you have to do what's right for your shareholders or in this case yeah. you know for your customers so i think at that that ultimately propels things you know yeah. always at the end of the day no one's i i think you'd have it had to be pretty extreme to, to let the business burn you know yeah. just because i don't like this guy you know yeah so i think um i think bitcoin mining is really interesting from that perspective too because technically mm-hmm we all are competitors, but in a different way than most businesses. We're not out there yeah. competing for customers. We're competing for blocks. And yeah. that's really just driven by our hash rate. Yeah. So all, we we will improve our chances just by accumulating more hash rates. So the competition is different in that regard. I think more of our competition is focused around 
uh, the public markets, yeah. you know, wanting investors, wanting uh, in, interest in our stocks. Yeah. So um, we are competitive, I think, from that standpoint, but different than, yeah. than most industries. Yeah. And then on the other hand, though, we are all a part of this new evolving industry and an industry that's often under attack. Yeah. So we very often find ourselves aligned like trying to advance the industry together. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the Bitcoin Mining Council is, you know, is a good example of that. Wasn't a super popular idea in, in the beginning. Yeah. And I understand people <laughs> still don't find, find it a popular <laughs> idea, but you know, what it's basically has done is you know, leaders of, the, of all these different companies come together, aggregate data, and we put them out. Yeah. And I know that we, we are all aligned with advocating for this industry and, and, and trying to protect it. And uh, so inter interesting from that regard as well. So I, yeah. I, I think am amongst the public Bitcoin miners, like we all, CEOs, like we all kind of know each other. The industry yeah. is, is small in that way. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, you, you kind of touched on what we're seeing different companies have problems now. Yeah. Um, whether that leads to consolidation or not, you know, time can tell. Seems very, very likely. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, th I think these types of relationships ultimately play a role in how that comes yeah. together. Yeah, I think the one thing that I've always taken away from just working in industry and then working in crypto for a few years now is like how much relationships matter. And mm -hmm. it's very hard to like show that off in like any sort of media suite or product. Everyone's looking at data or they're looking at headlines, but. Yeah, I always hear the phrase like I have a good relationship with yeah. another team and that's how people build together. And then we sort of forget it when we see like large liquidations that's happening with FTX and uh and Binance or with you know, other teams out there. Uh just turning to like the mining sector itself. Any quick thoughts on like what's happening with Argo or Core or anybody else over the last month? I mean it's been pretty brutal. And like you said, I think most mining teams are cheerleading for each other. Mm -hmm. There is an angle of competition there, but it it's been pretty brutal to watch all these teams just struggle over the last few weeks. Wonder if you have any thoughts on how they're handling it or how they get out of it. Well, I think with Bitcoin, two things are true at the same time. One thing, the market will swing in your favor more yeah. than you anticipate, and it also swings against you more than you anticipate. So I think over 2021, um, a lot of us saw upsides you know, in, in Bitcoin that Maybe we didn't even see that the price yeah. would go up that quickly. Uh, but you get the reverse of that as well. And I think over 2021, things have gotten worse from multiple angles. People yeah. have anticipated. Price has gone down while difficulty has gone up. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, so as Bitcoin miners, we have two major variables yeah. that, were, that you'd have to work with. Um, the price of Bitcoin, uh, the network difficulty, and then depending on what your energy strategy is, yeah. Your, your cost of power. And we saw all three of those things work against some players yeah. uh, and put incredible stress on their businesses and their balance sheets over the past several months. So I, I think that's what we're seeing, like kind of a perfect storm yeah. uh, of these variables uh, in, in many cases outside of uh, outside of a miner's control. Yeah. So, you know, from Riot's perspective, we have, it's a new industry, so I can't say we've been around for mm -hmm. a super long time, but I think being around for five years is pretty long from the Bitcoin mining space, yeah. particularly the publicly traded Bitcoin mining space. Yeah. So we've learned a lot through that, and we've seen what Bitcoin can do, what difficulty can do, and what power can do as well. And that goes a lot into how you mm -hmm. know, we manage our business and try to plan for the future and maintain maximum flexibility. So, you know, yeah. as, a, as a result of that, we've got ourselves in a pretty good position today. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think other players are find themselves in the stress position because just so much stuff moving against them. We'll get to right in a second. Definitely have a lot of updates to go through there. But while we're still on the subject, I want to keep going along the line of questioning. I kind of look at all the miners with like, they have their same cards, right? You get, everyone has the same cards, mm -hmm. but it's like, how do you play them? So you said like low energy costs, you have to have that as an input. Bitcoin difficulty, everyone's going to be dealt same difficulty. And then just managing your costs, buying machines correctly, those sort of things. What have been some strategic decisions that you've seen over the last year, two years from other teams that you've kind of winced at? And you maybe saw that headline, but like, oh, why did you make that purchase? Or, I mean, uh, certainly there's like, ASIC broker deals that come across your desk or like the desk of your employees that mm -hmm. you're looking at them and be like, that's not something we want to purchase. And then you know where it went. 
you know who purchased that later and you're like, oh, that was a, that was a poor choice. Mm -hmm. Has there been instances like that over the last 18 months, 24 months where you've seen a few teams out there make some of those purchases? And maybe if you have some examples off the top of your head, that'd be interesting. And, and how you sort of think playing against other people that are in the landscape. So I, I, I think in, in some regards, we all have the same cards, yeah. but it really comes down at the end of the day to capital and cost of capital is what sets what those cards are. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how to elaborate on the card analogy to make that make sense, <laughs> but you know, like, so like, you know, you talk about cost of power being an obvious input. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, but you know, your, your ability to control that is going to be dependent on the uh, environment you operate in. Um, and, and also, you know, like you touch on the relationships that you have in that operating environment yeah. and then the balance sheet you have to handle those fixed power agreements. Yeah. A lot of people probably don't know they're not generally always so simple as you're signing an agreement and now you're getting power for, for 10 years. Yeah. There's, um, there's uh, you know, an approval process to get load. There is deposit requirements to get that mm -hmm. uh, block. And then there are collateral requirements for maintaining that block. Mm -hmm. When you look at elevated power prices right now, that can move against you uh, very quickly if you aren't structured correctly or with a strong enough balance sheet. So yeah. that, that's why I say like, yeah, I think we all have those same cards that we're looking to play, but then it, there are, I think, are variables that impact how th yeah. th those hands are dealt to you. Um, with respect to stuff that we've seen competitors do, um, I could... I could probably tell you uh, yeah. uh, quite a few examples. Um, you know, speaking more generally, I think that there's been um, some some financing de decisions mm -hmm. that I think have been uh, uh, tough for a lot of players over the recent mm -hmm. year or so. Um, we've been pretty adverse to minor financing, but the rates are high. Yeah. They are subject to collateral requirements that can be, you know, difficult to, to meet, volatile yeah. uh, in, in how those swing. And I think what we're seeing is those are, are really moving against a lot of people. That's yeah. probably one of the core, I mean, there's multiple issues, but it's those minor financing deals that have been very tough. Yeah. And, and I think that's, I, I, I don't think minor financing is wrong though. Yeah. I think they're priced the way they are. They're structured the way they are because the industry is still nascent. Okay. You know, these debt products are still being developed and, you know, um, this, this isn't, I think, working out great for the lenders or the customers. Yeah. So as an industry, both sides of the table are going to learn from this, yeah. and that's going to improve things going forward. I, I also think that um, 2021 caused a lot of miners to be super focused on scale. Yeah. And I'm the last person to tell you that that's not important. Yeah. You know, Bitcoin mining is a game of constantly scaling, right? It's very focused on a continuous a cycle of scaling on uh, all the time. Yeah. But um, I, I think it was very easy during that bull market to get overextended, yeah. just trying to drive that hash rate number up. And I think... Um, I think that ties back to what we were talking about before about you know how we're competing for investors. Yeah. There's only so many variables that you, you you can work with right now to explain your story to the investing community. Yeah. They're still learning about how this industry works. So many things that you know we all understand as being mm -hmm. important to mining. Most people they're kind of just like at the hash rate level. Yeah. More hash rate. Good. That was the 2021 <laughs> investing thesis. It really was. And, and then I think in 2022, now I think it's starting, people are starting to figure out, okay, wait, uh, cost of yeah, cost of power, this is important too. Yeah. So I think that the investing public is learning more and maturing. And I think that's reflected in the type of research and articles we see covering yeah. this now. Yeah. yeah. You stole my question. I was actually going to ask you about minor financing. I'm glad you brought that up because for someone who's outside the space, you look at 15% plus interest rate, which a lot of these are around there, like that's predatory, right? It's just like way too high. But at the same time, it's very expensive, hard to get all these things off the ground. And Nidig now has like thousands of machines. What's their plan with them? Like some of them they've inherited like facilities, operations, they're able to build on it. But in other cases, they just have boxes. So I think to your point, both sides are kind of sorry and out of luck in that case. They're, they're learning. I mean, yeah, yeah. What, what's tough is it's like, it's not like yeah. the, the way the industry works, it's not necessarily like, oh, one, one miner's going under, okay, and now um, the, the lender's collecting that collateral. Like the same things are affecting everyone. So it's all <laughs> happening at once, you know? Um, 
And I, I would add, you know, you talked about the interest rate yeah. being high for sure. But on the other side of this, like these were really, these were leverage plays on Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, th these strategies are a huge success if Bitcoin, you know, mm -hmm. went up or stayed the same or, uh, you know, it was at least a more positive positive price movement for a price movement than, than what we've seen. Yeah. So, you know, in, in some timelines, those are all good decisions. Yeah. But I think Bitcoin mining is all about staying power within multiple outcomes because it is so unpredictable from so many angles. Yeah. Now, that's been one of the most interesting things to learn about, I would say, is the capital markets since May or so. They're just kicking off with like Terra Luna. And then over July, seeing where the interest rates have changed. Mm -hmm. We had the Galaxy Digital team on this podcast and they were talking about interest rates at the time and how they're expecting things to unfold. And a lot of that has come true. And yeah, I mean, I just feel for a lot of people on both sides of the table. Um, yeah, but we can leave that conversation there. I want to get into more Riot specific stuff. Rockdale and Corsicana. Right. Maybe we can start with Rockdale, talk about like the status of that and then move over to Corsicana and talk about like the news with you guys breaking ground. Sure. And then I have a bunch of follow-ups on like how you guys are scaling two places at the same time. Like how do you guys manage that as an internal team? That's on like astronomic levels of difficulty. Um, but we'll start with Rockdale and then move on. Sure. So Rockdale uh, is such an incredible story. Um, you know, that team started that project really only three years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I say started, it was an empty it wasn't even empty dirt. It was a forest. Okay. Yeah. So that founding team started that project just three years ago at nothing. When Riot acquired Winstone in May 2021, a incredible amount of building and progress had been done since then. It was 300 megawatts of developed capacity. Yeah. The first thing we did is initiated a 400 megawatt expansion project to take it to its current ca total capacity of 700 megawatts. Um, we are on the end of that expansion right now. And it's really incredible to reflect on because um, I, I think from our perspective, even though it's spanned you know, multiple years and has different components to it, it is still one big expansion kind of yeah. generally. We were buying miners in 2020. Yeah. We were buying S19 starting in spring 2020, scaling up over the end of summer, scaling up over the fall, buying miners through 2021. And then starting in 2020, building build this infrastructure. So it really is an incredible yeah. single project that is coming to conclusion here. We have completed two immersion-cooled buildings, mm -hmm. 100 megawatts each, so 200 megawatts of immersion-cooled infrastructure. As far as we're aware, that's the largest deployment of immersion cooling uh, globally. Yeah, We're also building two other air-cooled buildings, 100 megawatts each. Those are... Um, we're deploying in the the first of those two right now, and the second one's you know we're being worked on being completed. So we're anticipating uh, by Q1, all of that construction is going to be complete. Our minor orders uh, concluded at that time as well, and we are expecting to have 12 and a half exahash deployed. Um, that is, I, I think, uh, going to be a pretty remarkable milestone in the company's history. Yeah. Executing on that scale, building what I believe is the world's largest Bitcoin mining facility, throwing that much immersion in there, yeah. you know, st picking up and doing something that hadn't been done before at that scale, doing it, and uh, leveraging our power strategy further with all that hash rate in that one location. So that is, um, I guess, then kind of leads into Corsicana. Yeah. Because like we talked about, Bitcoin mining is always a game of scale. And you can take somewhat of a view on the marketplace, but I think like, just like if I were to advocate buying for Bitcoin for someone, yeah, you know, when people talk to me about that, it's always the same answer. Dollar cost averaging, mm -hmm. keep it reasonable, keep it manageable. Not like Bitcoin's 18, oh wow. <laughs> Bitcoin's <laughs> under, we're learning this, yeah. this matter. Bitcoin's under 19,000, yeah. <laughs> you know, all in. I, you know, that, yeah. that, that isn't a, a, a reasonable strategy. You can have some view, you know, hey, the market's depressed mm -hmm. right now. We want to move at this time. But generally, I think it's important to always kind of be averaging in. Just like, you know, dollar cost average into Bitcoin, I think you dollar cost average into hash rate and scale the same way. Mm -hmm. And we, we've wanted to position ourselves that way. So we weren't entirely reliant on, uh, the availability of new capital to continue yeah. doing what we want to accomplish. So to support that, we have a um, 
uh, we just filed a Q3 financials. Mm-hmm. So as of September 30, we got 255 million in cash and no long-term debt. Yeah. So that puts us in a good position to to continue uh, on these growth plans. And now that the market is depressed, you know, th- this is where you get the upside of that averaging in. Yeah. So uh, to do that, Corsican is the next step. Rockdale's at its uh, 700 megawatt capacity. So we're building this one gigawatt site in Corsicana. What's great about this is it's two hours away. Yeah. Now that's a lot of um, that, that's a lot of building in one location. Uh, well, I mean, in two different locations. But the fact that they're two hours apart means that we can move people yeah. and equipment back and forth. Uh, we are building a whole new team there as well. Mm-hmm. But the process is, I think, so much de-risk and so much supported by having everything two hours yeah. away. So I, I think that's great. We've broken ground on that. Um, that building, I think, is going to be really exciting because uh, we're doing everything right from the beginning. And I think the result is going to be, you know, I think our Rockdale is definitely a world-class Bitcoin mining facility. But I think this is going to, you know, not only operate yeah. very well, but really is going to have a great look to it. And I think yeah. it's going to be a symbol of the professional, the the professional direction this industry is going, yeah. and the industrial direction this uh, industry is going. So we expect we're going to have miners starting to come online there at the uh, starting in Q4 of 2023. We're First phase of this expansion is 400 megawatts, mm-hmm. all immersion cooling. So leveraging what we've learned and building that out at an even a bigger scale. Right now, we're thinking that's going to be a split, half self-mining, half hosting. Yeah. But that is kind of still to be determined. And um, we're, we're really excited about it. I think it gives Riot a great... Uh, competitive positioning to be building and scaling during this downturn. Because yeah. that's what I think got Riot to the point it is today. Yeah. Is we were scaling in 2019, 2020. Bitcoin was 6,000, touching on 3,500. Uh, maybe only very briefly, but you know, yeah. markets were in disarray. And we we're like, we're buying S19s because we believe in this future. Yeah. And uh, we, we want to continue that. So keeping this balance sheet flexibility mm-hmm. and always a focus on responsibly scaling and leveraging our low cost of production with our power strategy. Let's go back to financing in a second. I want to talk about infrastructure. Mm-hmm. It was impossible to get a transformer or like anything during a lot of 2020, 2021. Mm-hmm. How did you guys keep building Rocktail? Like how did you keep the cogs turning when there was so many supply chain issues? Like i I just remembered even having conversations on this podcast or with other developers out there, like site developers. They could not get parts. They mm-hmm. could not get people. They could not get anything on time to their facilities. Like, how did you guys keep the facility moving? Was there delays we were, were not aware of, or maybe you guys did publicize them? I just don't know about it. Like, how did you guys keep this huge facility? Like, I, I think most people have seen the photos and videos, but mm-hmm. like, it's a ginormous facility. How do you keep that thing moving? Yeah. I, I, so, I mean, a, a few res- few uh, answers come to mind there yeah. that I want to address. Of course, you know, we weren't uh, um, immune to supply chain disruptions yeah. entirely. Um, there's only so much you can control, but I think we mitigated it very well, yeah. especially compared to the field. So, first off, that, you know, Winstone was built up during a bear market and they built up a team there. Mm-hmm. And that team had a track record of execution and a track record of building strong relationships with the suppliers. Yeah. And they were focused on continuing scaling. So when, when Riot came in, um, they had, it, it was very easy to, you know, work with the suppliers to, to get equipment ordered right away. Um, we have a strong history with suppliers of delivering on what we say we're going to do. Yeah. So that helps when you're trying to procure this equipment quite a bit. Um, so we, we had the, 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 the team there, you know, so that, that critical mass to get that development going and grow, not building something from scratch in 2021. Yeah. And uh, I touched on the supply relationships. And then also uh, we acquired in 2021 a company called ESS Metron located in Denver, mm-hmm. which is a electrical engineering and manufacturing company. So they were mm-hmm. one of the biggest suppliers to uh, Winstone um, and now Riot um, a, a, as a part of our company together. Now, they don't manufacture high-voltage transformers, but they manufacture a ton of other electrical equipment yeah. that we use. They manufacture part of the parts that we use uh, to uh, for our immersion cooling infrastructure. So 
that transaction was really big for us, not just for turning expenses into revenues, yeah. but getting that visibility and supply over the uh, control over the supply chain. Because you're right, at the scale, we need a lot of equipment. Yeah. Like very basic parts become very mm-hmm. difficult to do. And I think people talked about challenges getting high voltage transformers in 2021. Yeah. In 2022, I'm sure people are having a lot more trouble with much more basic components yeah. that we are like the high voltage transformers, I think, uh, ahead of the game on. Yeah. So that seems to be part of vertical integration for a mining company now is buy every part that you can get your hands on, especially for at scale. If you can afford it, like if yeah. you know you're going to expand and you can afford it, then you should be trying to procure these things way far in advance. And in the case of, I mean, a lot of this stuff, but particularly high voltage transformers, like yeah. there's going to be a market for that. You're not, mm-hmm. it's not, not a sunk cost. If, if you have the staying power, if you have the visibility mm-hmm. in building into the future, uh, then you want to be procuring things sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. But you know, once again, that goes into you know one your relationships that we've talked about, and then two what we've talked about yeah. how much capital you have to, to allocate to being that forward thinking. Yeah. Yeah, one thing you said before the podcast started here was that Bitcoin miners are the most leveraged long, and it's true. I, mean, yeah. I was looking at videos of uh, Rocktail the other day, and I was just thinking about it, like getting myself to buy like five grand of Bitcoin or whatever amount. It's like it can be hard. You know, put that money into it, mm-hmm. and then look at you guys just like tilling up the earth in Texas. Like that's a lot of money. It's mm-hmm. a lot of conviction that in ten years Bitcoin's still going to be around, and that facility is going to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. In terms of financing these things, how do you guys get retail, since you're public, and others to invest in the company and like buy into these plans? Specifically for Corsicana, my, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you guys are going to the, to the markets again to get more shares and and to be able to build this whole new facility. Mm-hmm. So how does that pitch go out? How do you guys give that idea to investors and have them buy into the vision that you guys have? And then for yourself, how do you guys buy into that vision working, right? like? It's the largest Bitcoin mining facility in the world, mm-hmm. the Rockdale one, and of course Canada seems to be going to beat it. So, mm-hmm. like, that's a huge vision. That's like the LeBron James of Bitcoin mining facilities. So, like, how do you guys buy into that as a team? I think, well, first off, uh, to successfully execute here, yeah. you, you really have to believe in what you're doing because there's no, you, you, you're really, you know, you're burning the boats. Yeah. The, what we're building with Bitcoin mining infrastructure, it's, it's focused on that Bitcoin mining. And I think what we've done is built a team, built a culture of people that believe in what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Now, we have 500 employees approximately. I can't tell you that every single person is a huge Bitcoin bull. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you at the management level, there is an aligned Bitcoin vision. Mm-hmm. So we have an incredible group of people that are talented at what they do. They believe in Bitcoin and they believe in mining as a tool to um, uh, capture the upside of that future. Um, but 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 even if you don't have, it's, it's been incredible to, to meet all the people and learn all the personalities and motivations. Even if you are not you know a huge Bitcoin bull, maybe that just isn't, yeah, of interest to you, people attach so much pride in their quality of work, mm-hmm. being good and yeah. building big. So, to the and actually, you know, we put out a great video actually just this morning, mm-hmm. a documentary on our a docu series we're doing on our people, and you'll see electricians talking yeah. about how much they believe in Bitcoin and how awesome it is to be building infrastructure around Bitcoin mining. But then there'll be other guys on the ground who, uh, you know, guys and gals who um, are driven by their pride of work, what they're doing for their team and what they're building with their community. Because you can imagine building a business that big out in rural Texas has a very positive impact on that community. Sales tax revenue, jobs that's created, uh, other types of tax revenue, and that's something that's important to us, and that's a formula for our success. Um, so I think I went down a direction there. I need to get back to your. <laughs> no, I need, need to get good. back to your question here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so historically, we have relied on equity financing. Yeah. We keep very close tabs on debt options all the time. That's mm-hmm. something we spend a lot of time working on because I think that that is going to be a part of our financing strategy uh, mm-hmm. in the future in some way, but. We have been so mindful not to put the business at risk. Yeah, we're, we're trying to build this up to reach this critical mass, and 
um, until the business can rely on internal financing, mm-hmm. it requires external financing to get there. And I think our message to the market today is a track record of execution. Mm-hmm. We have a team that has continued to build, keep the keep the business in a position where it can continue to build and um, you know realize the benefits for the expansion that we've done. Yeah. It's it's a lot easier for us to go and say, hey, we've built 700 megawatts, we're going to build a gigawatt now, yeah. than to say, hey, uh, we're, we haven't done this before, but we think we got a good idea. Yeah. Um, not to say that the latter is impossible, yeah. but that track record of execution, I think, is so key. Mm-hmm. And that's what, we, that's what we focus on. We have a team that is experienced building this. We have a history of making large expansion plans and executing mm-hmm. on them, and that's what we're going to continue to do here. Let's talk about mining equities while we're on the subject. If you look at them, it's like 98% down, 95% down, 96% down. And you just go to the list. It's brutal. I think the biggest winners of the losers is down like 70% yes. from the 52-week high, something yeah. around that. We won't say any names, but people know who they are. It's rough. And that's part of the business model, I think, like we are talking before. You're leveraged playing Bitcoin, so when... Stocks were going up when Bitcoin was going up. Stocks were just all time high. It was great to be an investor. And now we're on the other side. There is a bad resemblance to a lot of tokens out there, though, that are mm-hmm. also in that death spiral. So I'd be curious to get your take on it. Is it wise to invest in mining equity as an investor, knowing that it's going to be so cyclical? Or do you have to know how to play into it? And then as a business that's trying to get people to purchase your equity you want to per- they want you want them to get into your vision right mm-hmm. how do you communicate to them that it's a safe thing to put their money into well d- definitely not going to be giving financial advice here yeah. but um you, you you talked about the downturn in this cycle yeah um honestly though like you look back not too dissimilar to previous cycle mm-hmm. right hit a high in 2017 i think of around 40 dollars a share in 2020, it went as low as 55 cents a share. I think, I don't know if it closed, but interday trading. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have seen very, very volatile downward moves uh, yeah. from past bear markets. And then, you know, Riot went from a low of 55 cents a share to as high as 79.50 a share in 2021. A mm-hmm. um, lot of movement all over the place. So I, I, I don't necessarily think I draw parallels to altcoins, yeah. but I would say they are... Very volatile plays, yeah. uh, risky plays. Risky because they're volatile. Yeah, um, you know, risk is a is is a sliding scale. It's not you know necessarily it's going to uh, win or lose. Yeah. Um, but I think that the leverage play on Bitcoin is still compelling. Mm-hmm. What we do as a Bitcoin miner at a very basic level is we buy energy for one price and then we convert it to Bitcoin and then we sell or hold that Bitcoin at a higher price. Yeah. I think that is a not too dissimilar to other types of commodities uh, out there. Yeah. Um, and I think with more people understand about it from those terms and then um, believe in your demonstrated capability to do that, yeah. I think uh, the, uh, the more confidence you're able to drive. That's another thing that we um, should have talked about in, in the past question as well because you know yeah. power is getting so much focus now yeah and i think our demonstrated track record with our power strategy i think drives a lot of confidence and i think that you know that's something that we demonstrate as a um real value add that we have a real advantage that we have in producing bitcoin yeah. so um yeah all, all investments carry uh risk yeah uh, Anything touching Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, mm-hmm. uh, besides maybe Tether, is going to have a, lo- a lot of risk. Uh, or, I mean, I should just say stable coins. Yeah. Uh, we won't call it anyone specifically. You yeah. know, besides stable coins, you have a lot of risk. Um, but you know, if you believe in Bitcoin, mm-hmm. then I think a leverage play on a Bitcoin future is interesting. Let's talk about the business models for Bitcoin mining right now. We're seeing a lot of them break down. Mm-hmm. That might be unfair. If we're seeing a lot of models not working in conjunction with the financing options that they've made over the last year or so. Yeah. You guys are focused on self-mining, though there is a hosted element to some of the legacy contracts you've inherited through Winstone. Curious to know your thoughts on the hosting model going forward. Are you guys all in on 
to build and self find model because you think it's most robust for your shareholders? Or do you guys see some other strategies out there that are pretty favorable, but just not right for Riot for various reasons? Uh, I'm just thinking about like Core had a lot of facilities they built, they hosted, they had to boot a lot of people in time, had to be a little bit more flexible. Then we look at teams like Argo where they built their own, but they didn't quite get the energy contracts right. And so now they're facing some problems. You guys seem to be like in a much safer spot. You've built your own stuff. You have the energy contracts in place. You've been there for years. It's expensive, but it seems to be paying for itself pretty easily. So I'm going to boot it over to you. Get your thoughts on that. Like, yeah, so I, I think we're interested in a, in a hybrid. We're both uh, scaling our self-mining business yeah. and our hosting business. Um, I think that um, both have different types of appealing qualities. Yeah. Mining, self-mining is the you know, most maximum view you're going to get on Bitcoin. Hosting, depending on how the contract is structured, ends up, can very simply just end up being we're, you know, like a commercial lease. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're this, it costs us this much to procure this space and we're giving it to you this much. Yeah. And that's a lot more um, uh, capital light approach to Bitcoin mining. The, the biggest asset you're purchasing is mm -hmm. miners. That yeah. cost, if you're building a 100 megawatt building, your biggest expense is going to be the miners. So if you're looking for a uh, kind of a, a lower capital, uh, maneuver mm -hmm. uh, move in the industry. You, you build a building and you can host it to a third party client and they're going to buy the miners and do it. So both of those things are business lines that we want to scale. And I think that oftentimes the decision on which one to wait more is a cost of capital one. Yeah. If the cost of capital is high, then okay, we, we don't want to be purchasing too many miners. You know, we can push on the hosting side. Yeah. Cost of capital is low, great, we have access. Okay, we can get miners cheap. All right, let's push on that side yeah. then. Um, so it's it's kind of those two pedals that we have to work with. I think um, a similar theme to our previous discussion is the industry is still nascent and people are figuring out the hosting agreements that most makes yeah. make the most sense. I think in the examples we're seeing of there being problems, it uh, really comes down to power in a lot of those cases. Yeah. Um, either someone is self-mining and not getting power cheap enough, or they have a hosting agreement at a competitive rate that ends up being different than what they can deliver pricing yeah. for. So I think as an industry, we're once again, we're figuring out, we're yeah. figuring out debt miner financing <laughs> and we're figuring out hosting agreements. Yeah. And that structure, I, I, I think it's, I think it's a messy process for yeah. everyone figuring out there's failures along the way, but eventually we're going to, uh, arrive on that and internally we are spending a lot of time on that, yeah. thinking about that, modeling out different outcomes, and um, uh, get, getting there. And I, I think uh, going forward, power is going to be a much more sensitive discussion, yeah. uh, especially in these large-scale agreements. No yeah. one's going to want to take the risk on power anymore, mm -hmm. right? Like the the, yeah. the 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 miner who's buying hosting space is going to want some assuredness of cost. But then at the same time, I think the host is not going to want to put themselves in a position where they have to deliver a service yeah. at a price lower than what they can procure it at. And I think there's some interesting things that have to be done uh, to figure out a model structure that yeah. makes sense. I think from our perspective, the advantage we carry there is you know this track record of power strategy, combining all these different elements really centered around a fixed power price agreement. Yeah. So I think we can um I I think we can be very competitive and give a lot of assurance to customers around that. Yeah. So um yeah, I I, I think we are learning and, and power is power has been crazy over the past couple of years. Yeah. Power people thought it was at a bottom in 2020 mm -hmm. and it kept going down even more. Uh, and then 2021, people thought that power was going to go back down again. You know, okay, it's just a bump up. It's going to go back down again. And uh, black swan events like a war in Ukraine happen, and then mm -hmm. energy goes up crazy for everyone. And now people are scrambling, and it's just all these uncertain, unpredictable events that can happen. Yeah. And the more in an industry that is marked by so much volatility outside of yeah. our control, the more you can control, the better your power cost, your cost of production, and your counterparty risk. Yeah. That's why we employ the vertically integrated strategy to control all of those things as much as possible and minimize the risk to our business. Mm -hmm. Follow up on that. Your guys' Q3 numbers, 
came in with like some slight disappointments from Wall Street analysts that were looking at it. And the rationale given from you guys was that you had to curtail a lot because mm-hmm. it's, it's Texas and they do that. They got to curtail. What's it like working with ERCOT when you guys have such large loads on the grid? And how do you guys go through that process? I mean, I get so many email questions from people asking about ERCOT, ERCOT, ERCOT. Like, how do we work with them? Yeah. How do we you know, get on the grid in the first place? And then once I'm there, what should be the expectation of working with something like ERCOT? Because it really is different than a lot of other grids that you're working on. The dynamic is so different. But from your experience, what, the, what is that curtailment like? What's that uh, putting the energy, grid, energy on the grid like? So um, I'll, tr- I'll try to work backwards. Let, yeah. let me know if I missed anything. So, you know, ERCOT now has this large uh, flexible load task force that's approving, I think, interconnects over 75 megawatts. Now, as the grid operator, they're trying to plan and understand where capacity is going to be. Yeah. And, you know, when they're expecting a load to come in at a certain point of the grid, there's plans that are made around that. And if that isn't executed on, that you know leaves them disappointed yeah. and it sours their view. And I, I think there was probably a bit of that that led to this large uh, flexible load task force being introduced and this approval yeah. process being introduced. Once again, I think our history and our track record is an advantage here. We're not saying we're going to go build one gigawatt, trust us. Yeah. It's like, we did this over here, we're going to do it again. Boom. Yeah. Uh, that helps a lot. And that's why we were the first ever load, one gigawatt load for Bitcoin mining approved mm-hmm. uh, in ERCOT. Um, now, they are the grid operator. The market itself is deregulated, which makes it fantastic and which I think creates mm-hmm. so much opportunity and allows all these market mechanisms to effectively, efficiently balance load. When you talk about curtailment, we don't have any curtailment requirements. Mm-hmm. It is all voluntary. There are these different programs and options of things that we can do mm-hmm. that both support the grid and bo- and simultaneously help our economics. That's why I said beautiful market mechanisms to drive uh, yeah. positive behavior. So when we are curtailing, I mean, I, I, I don't want to go too deep down the rabbit hole of all the yeah. different d- types of programs, but there's um, one of the major things that we've done is leverage our fixed price agreement mm-hmm. to sell power at spot when it is higher than our fixed price agreement. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I should well, it's also higher than Bitcoin mining revenue. And that came up a lot over this past summer because, well, Bitcoin mining economics were low. You know, yeah. we're averaging, I don't know, for an S19 Pro, 100 over the summer. I mean, obviously it's down now, but over the summer, maybe $120 a megawatt hour. Mm-hmm. So, when we're purchasing power at a fixed rate less than that, yeah. and the price of power goes above that 120, it's going to make sense for us to curtail. And um, you know what, what we're doing is responding to a market signal that's saying demand for power is high, yeah. supply is low, and we're like, okay, here's this load. I think that has a very beneficial impact on on the grid by making capacity available, and then that is uh, good for our financial results as well. So I think that became. Um, a little difficult to come through in the yeah. financials. When we do that type of, let's call it economic curtailment, it doesn't, um, re- it, it it is it shows up as a credit on our next on our power bill for that month. Yeah. So I guess we're getting a little bit into accounting here. Yeah. But that's not a revenue, and that's not an adjustment to cost of revenues mm-hmm. on our on our financials. That is its own line item that we yeah. just say power curtailment credits. So what we did is we introduced a non gap figure uh, in, in our MDNA that explained like okay if you take mining revenues and we did this for hosting as well, but if you take mining revenues, the cost of revenues, and you look at the proportional amount of power credits that should be applied to that, yeah, that's what that's how we're looking at the margin for that business, and when you do that you see that our margin in Q3 2021, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Q3 2022, was relatively stable with our margin of 2021, the same period. Um, And I think that's really important. When Bitcoin price is down, what, 60% over that same time, Mm -hmm. difficulty is probably double over that same time, we achieved a pretty consistent margin. So I I think that was a very positive story that, that, that came out. And that did decrease revenues because we're not mining Bitcoin when we're selling power. But when you look at the full picture of how that impacted the finances, especially relative to the market conditions outside of our control, um, I think I think there's a pretty positive story that came through there. Two more questions before you. Sure. For you before you go. S19 XPs. Mm-hmm. For every three months, there's a new basic question out there, whatever that is. 
kind of parallels against like the altcoin scene where there's a different token every day you can talk about. But <laughs> in uh, mining, it's like, oh, new ASIC topic for the next three months. And right now is S19 XPs. Are people using them? Are they plugging them in? And is it the bet you're supposed to make? So Marathon is predicting that 66% of its fleet will be S19 XPs. They're flipping them. They're using like a credit they got from Bitmain in order to do that. Mm -hmm. For you guys at Riot, how do you guys think about ASIC purchases, ones that you've already made, ones that you continue to make, and then notably Immersion as well? Uh, as you said earlier in the conversation, ASIC purchases matter. It mm -hmm. might be the highest cost for any capital that you're putting on the books. So how do you guys think about ASIC purchases? So we have um, uh, we have deployed or ordered 30,000 XPs. Mm -hmm. So we, we've entered into a purchase agreement to, with a Bitmain for 30,000 S19 XPs. Uh, we've, we have already begun deploying them. We have mm -hmm. some in immersion. We have some in our air cool building. They are the most efficient machine out there in the market. And I think, you know, when you look at uh, pricing in the secondary market, they are, or even the, the primary market, they are priced that way. Uh, as, as a Bitcoin miner, your risk of staying competitive is uh, diminished the closer you are to the most efficient hardware. Because yeah. if all other things remain the same, you know, if we all have the same cost of power, it's going to come down to the efficiency of the machines to be competitive and keep a positive margin. So from that perspective, the safest direction to go into mm -hmm. is um, the most efficient hardware, S19 XPs. Yeah. Now, what we're left out about that whole discussion, though, is the cost of that hash rate. Yeah. So then that just comes down to modeling. You use the same variables. You're looking at the cost of one hash rate cost to another. You know, what's the ROI time period and what are we modeling? That, that return profile is going to look mm -hmm. like over three years. So I think we are always focused on staying on the, 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 the end of the curve with the most efficient machines out there. Um, but, you know, that the decisions on the margin, you know, if you're maybe on the margin is... Um, mm -hmm taking too much away from it. But I mean, because the S19 XP is a pretty marked improvement over the S19 J Pro. So if you're deciding between those two things, I think it comes down to you know your assumptions and the pricing that you're getting for that hash rate. Yeah. Um, but I mean, generally focused on the most efficient equipment is a good idea. So yeah, um, I think um, I, I, and then I think there's another component is your view on what the future for ASIC efficiency is going to look like. Yeah. You don't want to, you know, invest so much in one generation and then you just quickly fall behind. I think that was a problem more historically with mining, but yeah. the curve of improvement has flattened out so much. We're down to 21 and a half joules per terahash. Yeah. You can only get so close to zero. Like at the end <laughs> of the day, these things have to use power, right? Yeah. So there's still going to be improvements. I, yeah. I, you know, I have no doubt, but the the rate of improvement is slowing down quite a bit. Yeah. So all is to say, there, there's a lot that goes into um, mm -hmm. making that type of decision. And there's some interesting research out there on you know valuing hash rate and and making that decision. But I think um, you know we're excited about deploying these S19 XPs. We've received uh, a good portion of our order. And we're receiving uh, more through the end of this mm -hmm. year, and then we'll we'll have those in, in swing. But I think um, you you know you also touched on immersion, so I, I don't want to leave that alone. That is another very interesting tool yeah. for leveraging ASICs. Um, we haven't gotten into our results on it yet, but you know obviously with a cooler environment, you're able to uh, overclock that machine, and Brains has put out research where you know they're achieving 20, 25 percent overclock without any loss of efficiency. Yeah, which is great. So you're basically using your infrastructure to get more hash rate instead of relying on solely ASICs. Yeah, that's why among you know that combined with the operational benefit of mm -hmm. uh, of immersion uh, is the reason we're going in that direction entirely in Corsicana. Um, so we are. Um, uh, immersion is, I think, going to offer uh, benefits in that in, in that area as well. We haven't. It's one of those things, though. Like people ask me all the time, you know, how, what what are you guys seen for overclocking? Uh, when are you going to share results? We're being very cautious to test lots of different operating conditions, yeah, and determine what we can safely do at scale. We don't want to ruin the equipment. Um, we want to get as much hash rate as possible. And as soon as we say we're able to get X percent overclock, the next question is going to be, okay, when are you going to be doing that for every single miner, right? Yeah. Uh, which I get. I mean, that's how we look <laughs> at it internally too. So we are being very cautious about what our deployment 
mm-hmm. and operational strategy is around there to make sure we get consistent results and to make sure that we're not damaging any equipment in the process. Okay, last question, the eternal question, where's Bitcoin going from here? <laughs> I have to ask the kicker. Man. But also, like, in the, if I can add on to it, the background is everything's going to hell, right? Like tech layoffs, interest rates going up. Saw something about like mortgage originations right now are like through the floor. How do you at Riot, you're helming this giant ship with 500 employees with two ginormous sites in Texas. How are you thinking about those macro conditions and then the business line you're operating with with Bitcoin operating in the background of that? When, when we build at Riot, when we plan, when we execute on our vision, it is a very long-term vision. Mm-hmm. So we're building these sites not to capitalize on opportunity in two, three, five years. Um, you know, especially the power infrastructure has a very long, useful life. So we're, we're focused on being able to mine Bitcoin and continuing to scale over long term. Now, the best way to, to to make it through these cycles is to simply be focused on having the lowest cost of production. With the difficulty adjustment in Bitcoin, mm-hmm. if you are on that lower end of the cost curve, then you should always have you know a, a margin there to, to drive your business forward. If 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 our you know, just using example numbers, if your cost of production is three cents a kilowatt hour and then everyone else is five, six, seven, yeah. the, the difficulty is going to adjust such that you, you're you going to have a healthy margin from that perspective. So that's what we aim to do. We yeah. want to, you know, yeah, we're focused on scale and we're also focused on getting as low and predictable of a cost of power as possible. And by doing that, I think that buys us staying power if mm-hmm. Conditions are going to, uh, poor market conditions are going to persist for some time. Um, I think from a Bitcoin mining perspective, it has the opportunity to get better even if the price does stay depressed because yeah. I think difficulty will turn around at some point. Mm-hmm. I think there's probably uh, many players out there operating less efficient hardware uh, and having higher cost of production that are trying to wait it out and eventually they capitulate yeah. and difficulty adjust. I, I, I mean, I think, I forget exactly what quarter that happened in the last cycle, but I, I feel like it was like, you know, later, mid 2019, mm-hmm. I, I, I think. I'd, I have to check a graph, but, you know, mm-hmm. somewhere around there, difficulty went up huge through 2018, even after the price went down. Um, so I think um, I, I, I tend to subscribe to the market cycles around the having mm-hmm. theory. Um, so I, I, it's hard to deny that continuing, uh, you know, over and over again, observing that past, um, not necessarily the best predictor of the future, because as you noted, there's these macro factors that maybe supported that somewhat in the past and will, will not have those um, you know, tailwinds this time. Yeah. But um, I think Bitcoin is, uh, hey, to quote Sailor, it's yeah. a swarm of cyber hornets, right? And I think the the utility and reason for Bitcoin is becoming more and more apparent every day. And macro conditions may not be great, but macro conditions are also showing people why mm-hmm. Bitcoin is important, why deflationary assets are important, mm-hmm. why sovereign money is important. So I'm optimistic that that message and that value proposition is going to continue to penetrate. Mm-hmm. And that's what's going to drive Bitcoin forward more than anything uh, over the coming years. And um, We'll do our best to support that. Yeah, Can't beat that. That's a kicker right there. <laughs> Jason, thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. Thank you for having me, William. <laughs>